Okay, growing from true thief. Most people don't know how to do it, or if they do do it, they mess up on one or more of the sequences. Sowing the seed about six to eight weeks before setting the plant out in the ground. I would suggest looking at uh, seven, six, seven, eight weeks, depending on how well they grow. You probably should experiment over a two week period. So in this area, if you put the potato plant, tomato plant out in May, I'd suggest starting somewhere the middle of March. If you want to experiment, go towards the early part of March, towards the latter part of March, first of April, no less. Once those seeds come up, at about 75 to 78 degrees is the best temperature. If you get up to 80, that's a little too hot. I barely cover the seed. Normally I put them in trays and I just poke my finger down in the tray to make a little depression, drop the seed in, and just a bare amount of soil over the top and just kind of cover it over and then press it down. Water it up and then I keep it warm. It doesn't matter if it's in light or in darkness. I prefer light because the soil dries out a little bit and I think that's more of a natural way to keep damping off avoided. If you put it in, in a, like a, a wrap over the top, you're going to get mildew on the soil. So it's very important that you have a disease-free soil, a, a peat light mix, a magnum peat moth, perlite for make the light. I don't know what you, do you have peat moth here so much? Mm, we don't have to use it. But Peat moss? You don't have too much of peat moss. It's going down. The government of um, it's not recommended here no. because it's it's being extracted. Okay, yeah. because They're of huge. the sources. The, the, yeah. here. Okay, yeah. in Canada, there's a lot of great bag of peat moss. The it, United States use bag of peat moss all the time. Coir is becoming more. Coir? Do you know that? Is that, that, that what they call it here? Well, from from coconut, from uh, oh coconut, milk okay. coconut. It's oh, right. horrible. It, it retains yeah. too much water. Uh, yeah. Okay, I suggest anything organic. You just make sure it's clean as possible. Hadn't had anything growing in it, so you don't have any pathogen whatnot started. So anything fairly sterile. If you have to uh, bake it, I used to bake the soil in the oven for two hours at like 200 degrees, 180, 200 degrees. That's not necessary. In fact, if you bake it, then you have other molds that grow on it because you got, it's like an invasive mold that comes in because everything else is dead. So I like it to be alive. So I purposely, in my seeding mix, believe it or not, I use uh, uh, worm casting as part of the soil mix because it's a natural uh, flow release feed and it doesn't burn anything. And I think the earthworm have a, uh, uh, the microbe activity with the earthworm casting is natural. I think it's just a natural way of growing seedling. So, long story, but I, I use uh, a little bit of dolomite lime to keep it somewhat uh, balanced on the pH, otherwise it's a, a real low pH interfere. So, they, they should germinate in about five days. It will take from anywhere from five days to three months for seed to germinate. So, I use the chemical trisodium phosphate, the hot water treatment, and Clorox to prepare the seed and that primes the seed for germinate for better than anything else I've found. Can you explain in more detail how you do that? The trisodium phosphate, when I'm extracting the seed, you know, break, I probably will demonstrate here later with at least some of the berries I have over here where I wash the seed out under the, with the strainer catching the seed and then I dump in a little trisodium phosphate, put a plastic glove on, rub that trisodium phosphate around the the seed and that breaks the gel down immediately. You can just see the sap and everything come out. Potato seed has a tremendous amount of sugary sap of waxes and oils and all that around the, the gel of that seed and you have to get rid of them because that complex is a seed inhibitor. If the seed drives with all that on it, it'll prohibit the seed from germinating. So the potato is meant to, when it reseeds itself, the berry fallen. Imagine there's a berry fall like acorn from a tree, do you really want those seedlings competing with mama because of all the tubers? No. So the idea is for those seeds to hibernate for several years in case the mother tubers are eaten or disrupted or and the berries stay green so that they can be carried away for a longer period of time. Do we have any potato berries that I can show here on the screen? Just pull out of one of those that has berries in it. It's from number thirty. Which one is this from? Did the bag have a name Num on it? Number 30. Number 30. 30? 30. Number 30, one of the Charpo Mira line. David said I could have this. He said there's no restriction on taking a berry from one of these new Charpo lines. You know, they can't control that. So that seed 
can be mine, you know. No problem with that. So that's why I have them. Uh, number 30, I don't know if it's going to be named any time or another, but I could probably find out. But anyway, when I extract, when the potato produces it, the vine can be totally killed by late blight, but the tuber, I mean, the berries will still be laying around or hanging on there. And then those are meant to be, stay green, and then they ripen up over an amount of time. And as opposed to the tomato, that uh, once you pick it, that, that's about it. Potatoes still ripen over a number of weeks. They stay very green, very hard, even in the presence of mud and wet. And rodents will pick them up and carry them somewhere, nibble on a little bit. Yeah, they're no good. They drop it. Another rodent comes along, takes it to a burrow, and it gets down in the ground. Oops, it's no good to eat either. And kicks it out. And it usually is wherever there's disturbed soil. So you get this first way out away from the mother plant. So anyway, once that picked and I let it set for a number of uh, weeks, sometimes months, I have a whole room full of uh, berry wait for me to get home that I picked uh, over two months ago. So I'll start extracting those also when I get home. I usually just cut them open or put them in a blender, whip them up, <laughs> float off the pulp in a colander and then uh, take that seed and then put it in a strainer and then put a little sprinkle of trisodium phosphate on there like salt, look like table salt. Rub it around, that gel starts dripping out of there like sugar water. Bloop, bloop. So once that's pretty well cleaned up, I rinse it off more water, hot water, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That seemed like it helped uh, activate the, uh, the, especially the tritonium phosphate, it worked quicker that way. And 120 doesn't hurt my hand so much, I kind of get my hand out of it in time time, but that hot water is just running it for a while. I got my heater set up where the water comes out of the faucet, 120, it's pretty neat to have. That's your thermostat, if it needs to set a little higher than 120 at the uh, heater, by the time it comes over here and you've been running a while, put a thermometer and see if it's 120. That way you can help prepare your seed. And I suggest 120 degrees Fahrenheit water for even a, an organic uh, thing. And you may not have been doing that on, on some of your seed. We would like to. But anyway, just uh, all you have to do is read the dope seed catalog and they talk about hot water treatment. And, Which seed uh, catalog? Which seed? Stoke seed company. Stokes. If you, uh, anyway, so once I got that uh, that trisodium hot water, rinsing the seed off, I, I float it off in water until I get rid of all the pulp and the seed float, or I mean sink to the bottom, and I put that in some water, and then one part of Clorox, five parts of water, let that set for a while. Usually I got several things going by the time that soaks in the Clorox, I've written down the pedigree on some paper, time I get that done, how many berries, when it would pick, you know, what the pedigree is back to different parents was it's an F1 or F2, whatever, and then I, uh, F2 implies that it could be open pollinated, could be some hybrid, but I call it F2 anyway. So once the Clorox uh, lightens that seed a little bit, you can actually see it lighten. It might go from a yellow to almost a white. I don't take it clear down to a white. And some seeds are dark color. That means they have a tendency to be more colorful potatoes when they have dark seeds. Most white and red potatoes have this real tan colored seed. So it's another way of identifying your germplasm by the color of the seed. Most people don't know this. So I'm only saying it for the obvious, the, the video is videoing me. So you got that? <laughs> you can tell what color a potato is going to be by the color of the seed yet. Also, you can color the, uh, take note of the potato berry. It can also tell you what kind of uh, flesh color you're going to have. This one you can tell it's going to be, uh, you can tell it's going to have red skin or at least a Desiree type skin. Once you identify and describe your berry and your potato and your seed, you can start making shortcuts on what you're looking for. Wait, what's a Desiree type skin? Is that pinkish? Or Desiree is just a very typical uh, red, uh, light red, pinky color, very prominent all over the world, probably the world most adapted potato. And what on the berry shows you that? And the berry, you can uh, you can start identifying characteristics of the berry by stripe, it dappled, its size, whether it's pointed. I got the mother berries if I wanted to show it of the uh, uh, Mayan series. The Mayan series have a pointed end indicating that they're diploid. Diploid, you can always tell the, the berries have a point on them. So if you have any, it says, something that says Mayan on it and uh, pointy fruit, I can talk about that.
Before that comes up, I'm just going through you. Uh, once you get that Clorox water run through a uh, sieve, you know, all to 120 degrees, that gets rid of all the residue of the, of the Clorox, and then you tap it on a towel and put it on the clean paper, let it dry. And I usually don't spread the seed out too much. I just let it dry in a, in a lump like a pancake batter, you know, just on there to dry. And then I just break it up later on once it's fully dry. That seed, if you uh, preserve it in a uh, in a plastic aluminum type seal, like a heat seal, or maybe even a, a drink wrap, and then put it in the cold storage or a freezer if you have that kind of access. And I suppose something like the Heritage Library would have a special seed storage that yeah. the seed could be good for 50 years. What humidity do you drive them to? I drive them whatever the humidity is in the room, it doesn't matter. This is a pointed one? But yep, here it is. Okay, now just, that should be one of the Mayan series, and I'll just hold these up by the stem. I don't know if you can see it on the uh, video here, here if it looks like you're catching it. The yeah. one here, the diploid, this is the tetraploid. I think that's pretty clear. And uh, I, I call it the strawberry type berry. It looks kind of like a strawberry. And I and I got these in all colors. I, I love I love these because I can breathe these up where they're entirely purple. And even the purple goes into the flesh. And then that's another earmark of the type of potato. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I just turned the oh, camera Oh, okay. On. The question was, how do you get a tetraploid out of a diploid? And what I was referring to here, when, the way I get it is I take a tuberosum mother, and quite a few of them, and then I take as many different kinds of diploid plant, collect their pollen, and some plants are more apt to produce unreduced gametes in their pollen. Some produce a lot, others very little, and it ranges from almost zero to as high as one or two percent of unreduced gametes. And by crossing time after time the pollen from the diploid to the tetraploid, you'll get in those hybrids. It usually will set berry, but a lot of times the berries will be, there's no seed in them. But occasionally you get a berry that's a nice plump berry. You cut it open, there's two or three seed in there. That's all you need to get the uh, the tetraploid. Because when you put an unreduced gamete with a tetraploid, you got a tetraploid, and it stays tetraploid from there on out. And I'm doing this over and over again to get the uniqueness of the diploid of all kinds of different crosses into tetraploid. And the more crossing I do, the more chances I have some that, that, are, that have the uh, underdue gamete. So, because of diploid being traditionally outbreeders, when you have a berry from a diploid uh, plant, it's almost invariable that it will not be self-pollinized seed because it wants to be outcrossed. It has uh, incompatible pollen, fruit, Characteristic, so it had to have a sibling or a cousin or some of the diploid to crop to it. So I'm using this also to create uh, uh, the the outcrossing uh, potential to transfer to tetraploid, so I can get my tetraploid to also have that incompatible pollen, so I can have uh, lines that are very free blooming, produce a lot of berry, but won't produce their own seed. Therefore, I can plant those next to another tetraploid and get all the hybrids I want between those two at a very low cost. And this also is another technique of, of providing food for the future by collecting and breeding, collecting and breeding, and then putting the unreduced gamete into tetraploid, collecting those that have uh, uh, incompatible pollen and use those to produce these hybrids where if I can go to developing countries I can get all kinds of hybrid seed to them at a very low cost and then as they grow those those hybrids out, many of those will also have un un uh, incompatible pollen, so they can save the seed from those hybrids and get a lot of hybrids once again and, and grow it again and again and again. That's what I'm trying to do to get developing countries where they have very low uh, uh, financial capital, but they have some ground, they have some uh, labor available, they can grow a lot of uh, uh, seedling plant, transplant them and get uh, all the potatoes they need and then just flush them out every year from the true seed to tubers and 